I'm Martin Logan and welcome to the Irish in the UK. Coming up on the show this week, we'll be finding out if the Birmingham Irish Centre is closing. Recently there was a big fundraising event in Manchester for St Joseph's Home. But first up, we'll be chatting to John White about his book called Kicking Through the Troubles. The book tells the story how football has united the communities in Northern Ireland. John, tell me about your book. Kicking Through the Troubles, How Manchester United Helped to Heal a Divided Community. I wrote that book back in 2013 when Sir Alex Ferguson stepped down as the manager of Manchester United. And it's only in the last year I decided to resurrect it, sort of with my memories of Sir Alex and Manchester United and what he'd done for the club and what he'd done for our supporters club. Now, first of all, uh, of course, you, you go through a lot of the history of Manchester United, the great games there. I've read certain things about United drawing with Arsenal and getting beaten in the cup final in days gone by, and Dave Sexton. And yeah, well, it's only my memories. I mean, I was born in 1962, so when I entered secondary school in Manchester United, we're a second division side, and I had to run the gauntlet of all the boys who supported Leeds and Liverpool at the time, and even Tottenham Hotspur were a big club back in Ireland, as were Everton, Celtic, obviously. But the, the book itself is sort of a span from 62 to 2013, but focusing on 1991 when I formed Carried Off Manchester United Supporters Club for, for both sides of the community, Catholics and Protestants in Belfast, and then right up to 2013 when Sir Alex left the club after 26 years and my association with Sir Alex through helping out with his mother's trust fund. Now, you run a unique trip, don't you? Because as you mentioned there, uh, your club is Catholic and Protestant. You, you travel across the sea to come and watch Manchester United. We do. We have 46 over today, Catholics and Protestants, both sides of the, of the religious divide, for want of a better term. We've had, um, obviously, peace in Belfast, for want of a better expression, since 1997 and the Good Friday Agreement, which was an anniversary yesterday. But you know, there's still certain parts where you know, it's, you're either a Catholic or you're a Protestant in certain areas across Northern Ireland, but our supporters club embraces both sides. And of course you grew up around Belfast, you've seen a lot of the troubles, and I know that you've experienced one of your school friends as well yes. being murdered. Yes, that was young Thomas McInulty, I can still remember it, but it was a dark time in the early 70s in Northern Ireland, particularly you know, where I lived in the Short Strand, which is in East Belfast. And it is a sort of a Catholic enclave surrounded by Protestant areas. So to leave it, it was an adventure in itself. And, you know, you always had to be on your guard. You know, it never leaves you. You sort of look over your shoulder. You see something not quite right. Or when I was a child in the 70s, there wasn't a lot of cars in my area because people didn't have a lot of money. So if you seen a car sitting there, you paid attention to it because it could be a car bomb. How did that affect you seeing one of your friends murdered? I didn't actually witness the murder, but when I woke up the next morning and my dad, God rest him, told me that Thomas had been shot from a pillion passenger on a motorbike, it was a reprisal. It was a tit-for-tat killing, but Thomas was only a young teenager. The, the, the gentleman who had been murdered the night before was the Reverend um, Roy Bradford. So my area was easy just to drive in, Martin, shoot someone, drive out again and get away with it. Do you think the sport should be used a little bit more to unite the communities? Well, it already has been used. Look at Ireland, the Grand Slam champions. It doesn't matter if you're Catholic or Protestant. Um, it doesn't matter from your Ulster, Munster, Leinster or Connacht. You know, Ireland, the rugby team, the international team, brings both sides together, as does Ulster. Rugby team, that's the sport we can take a, a prime example from. For It doesn't matter what religion you are. If you follow that sport and you follow that club, you're all one family. Now, of course, your book covers a lot of the history of Manchester United. It covers a lot of the history about the troubles in Northern Ireland. And it also covers your trip across the Irish Sea here to unite fans and go to Manchester United. Now, tell us a bit, little bit about the group you've got with us here today. The group we have today is from Carrie Duff, from Belfast, from Camlock, from Newry. And we've also got a, a group of young adults with learning difficulties who are on, on this particular trip with us to see Manchester United against Swansea today. And it's great, there's, there's men, women, children, there's no tricolours, there's no Ulster flags, there's no Union Jacks, there's no Gaelic tops, there's no international jerseys, there's plain clothes and there's Manchester United and that's the way it is in our club. Now, tell us where people can buy your book from. You can buy my book direct from Empire Publications in Newton Street in Manchester online at Empire Publications or it's available on Amazon and you can also download it on Kindle. David, can you tell me, how long have you been supporting Manchester United? About 30 years, going across the Irish Sea. 
Have you enjoyed it most of the time? Yes, I have indeed. I enjoy most of my trips, unless we get beat. <laughs> well, absolutely. Uh, now, tell me a little bit about your uh, trips across, because, of course, you're a mixed group, aren't you? So tell me a little bit about the experience. Well, the experience is always good, with very little trouble of any description in the club. And both sets of supporters get on well together. And of course, you're, bo you're both Catholic and Protestant, yeah. but I know that you've all got one thing in common, and that's the colour of red. That's the colour of red. That's what Carry Duff Club's all about. It's a family oriented club, and we get on well together. Now, of course, look at the troubles in Northern Ireland uh, divided a lot of people, but you all seem to be here today different colours when you go back home maybe, but here today you're all enjoying the game, you're all having a good time, and it's great to see. It is indeed. John John runs a club uh, to perfection that way. There's no trouble within the ranks, and if there is, they'll get put out of the club, and that would be the end. Supporters Club in the early 90s um, with my father. Me and him had always been avid fans of Manchester United. We used to go over ourselves um, and it was a, a man that I used to work with, um, Jared, who introduced me to the club, who lived close to John White at the time in Winchester. Um, he, he was a Catholic at the time and I was working at the Ulster Hospital in Dundonald and he said, come along, you and your father would be more than welcome to join the club. So we joined in the early 90s together. Um, got my mother then into joining the club as well. Uh, then them two became avid fans and got their own season tickets so I stepped away from the club for a while and come 2013-14 season I've rejoined Carried Out Manchester United Club myself just to come over and enjoy, enjoy the crack with the matches. Yeah and I'm sure look at you look back on great times coming across the sea with your dad and of course your mum as well and great to see them involved as well. Well absolutely Manchester United is a family oriented sport you know everybody who loves Manchester United just loves to travel together loves to come over on that, on that ferry as you say um, over to Manchester just to see their favourite supporter favourite football team playing football. Now tell me about your experience coming over because you know I know you've travelled across a lot and I know you're a big supporter of Man United but tell me about the group and what you experience. Oh, the group is fantastic, it doesn't matter what trip you come on with Carrie Duff, everybody comes together, with men, women, children, um, Protestant Catholics, there's no such thing on, on a coach coming with Ma Carrie Duff Manchester United Supporters Club, it's all about Manchester United. <laughs> I'm sure they all had a great time at Old Trafford. Now the Birmingham Iris Centre has been open over 51 years and recently there's been a lot of speculation about the centre closing down. So we went along to meet John Fitzgerald and I began by asking him, is the centre closing? There's no chance of that happening. Not at the moment. It's been here for over 51 years now. Last year I had a 50th anniversary of the place and uh, with Mike Denver which was a great night. So there's no, r the, the rumours are always spread and they're always added to, but most of the times they're wrong. So the uh, may be a redevelopment next year, but there's no change between now and the end of this year and there's functions booked up right to the end of the year. So that's, if that's any indication of what's happening. Well, that's good because we're all delighted for the Birmingham Irish that the centre isn't closing down. Well, if it does close down maybe next year, it'll be just for redevelopment for a new Irish centre with a hotel. That's possibly the chance is of something like that happening. So I would feel that's what will happen eventually, but nothing is happening this year. Of course, you've got a beautiful shop here at the centre. And uh, do you still supply dancing shoes and various stuff to all the, the dancing groups around England? Oh, I do, yes. I sent a pair of dancing shoes up to Leeds only yesterday and I'm, s I, I'm always sending shoes up to, to uh, Josephine Keegan in Manchester, of course, your town, and she buys all her shoes for me. And uh, all the local schools are in for shoes. I had somebody in this morning from Coventry for shoes. But uh, so between that and all the different things that I do here, the jewellery and crystal and china and, you know, even Irish passport forms are always in for them. So you never know. <laughs> How long have you had the shop here at the centre? Uh, 41 years now. 
I, well, I, I started up in Spark with Brendan Shine and myself because I was managing Brendan in those days and we opened a record shop where Tara Records were on the Stratford Road in Sparkbrook. And so I was there for two years, but then I came in here on my own, so I've been here now 39 years in the centre. That's fantastic, John, and I have to congratulate you on your lovely shop. Now, going back to the centre here, of course, that's great news. And if, if a redevelopment does take place, it will be on this site, will it? I would say so. It'll be on this exact same site. I'd say that's what the way it'll be. It's just get all the plan and permission, everything in place, and uh, then we'll see what's happening from there. But it's not close, nothing will happen until it's redeveloped anyway. That's great news that the Birmingham Iris Centre is staying open. Now, I've got some channel news for you. As from next Thursday evening, we will be moving channel. You will find us on Sky 192. All the repeats on a Saturday evening will be broadcast on 192. So don't forget, next Thursday evening, you will find us on Sky Channel 192. Now, we're off for a quick break. Welcome back to the Irish in the UK. Now, if you've got a story to tell us or if you'd like to contact me, the details are on the screen. Now, recently St Joseph's Home in Manchester underwent major refurbishment and recently they held a fundraising evening to help with the costs and we went along to meet them and the Horton Weavers. Oh, God's kids has got a place in the choir Some sing low and some sing higher Some sing out loud in the telephone wire Some just tap their hands upon St Joseph's Home has been here for the people of Manchester since 1862. In, in the late 1970s, it was rebuilt and reopened in 1980 with what was then a new purpose-built building. And of course, it's been a beautiful building down the years and you've got your own chapel here as well. We have our own chapel, we have our chaplain and we have daily mass in the chapel. But the home, the, the, the dependency of the residents has increased since 1980. So we found that they need a lot more space, a lot more residents are using wheelchairs and needing hoists and various other, other things. Yeah. That they, so we wanted to give them more space and more comfort. So we're trying to upgrade the rooms, make them a little bit bigger and a bit more comfortable for the residents today. Well, let's say you've done phase one of it, and I have to say it looks really, really well. And, you know, the people that's moved into the new rooms are so happy and they look so comfortable and so at home. They are. They're very happy, thank God. And we're very grateful to all the people who have helped us to get this far. Fourteen rooms are complete now, and there are another six being refurbished at the moment. Some more residents will be moving into shortly. Now, Sister Mary Agnes, of course you were telling me earlier, you've done a lot of travelling in your lifetime. I have. <coughs> I've been working in Ireland, England, Algeria, and 23 years in France, Jersey, twice in Manchester, and maybe I haven't finished travelling, I could go around the world again if they send me, yeah. to care for the elderly. We care for them in the five continents, that is our special work, caring for the elderly, trying to make them happy and hoping that the families also are happy, knowing that we love their parents and try to do all we can for them. And of course, St Joseph's Home here has always been known as having quite a strong Irish congregation of elderly people. Yes, the majority are from Ireland. That's right. Yes. Yeah. And also we have homes in Ireland, in Dublin. There's two homes in Waterford. Three mm. homes altogether in Ireland. Mm -hmm. Mother Josephine, if people wanted to donate or help you out financially, how can they do that? They can do it in several ways. First of all, we'd be very happy to welcome anybody who'd like to come and see what we're trying to do here at St. Joseph's then we can always uh, accept cheques or cash donations 
or if they like to give online through the website, they can do it that way. And I think you have the details of the, the phone line that they can make a donation that way as well, if that's more convenient. Mary, can you tell me, how did you first get involved with St. Joseph's Home? Oh, we were very fortunate that my mother was able to get a place here when we were in urgent need of help. And she was here very happily for about two years before she died. And how old was your mother when she moved into the uh, home? About 85, yes. And I'm sure she enjoyed her time here. She was very well looked after. Oh, yes, indeed she was, yes. The family started all coming as well. We were all very well looked after. <laughs> And then you decided when your mum sadly passed away that, you know, you'd, you'd return some of the good work that was done and get involved yourself. Yes, you find gradually you're getting more and more jobs to do. And then I joined the association Jean Jugan, which is sort of the official um, volunteer um, a spiritual association as well. In the spirit of Jean Jugan, um, we try to help in whatever way we can show some talent. Now, Joan, of course, you're the main person here for the fundraising. Tell me how the fundraising is going at the moment. Um, well, we're doing a lot of, um, as Mary just said, collecting in, in stores, Tesco's uh, mainly. Um, f functions like tonight where we have um, the Horton Weavers. A few weeks ago we had um, an Irish night um, that was quite successful. Uh, we're hoping in the next two months maybe to do um, a race night uh, as well so lots of things that don't raise huge amounts of money but obviously every little helps so um, and then we try and get money from uh, we, we write to trust some places when you know for sort of these big jobs that we're doing as well and hope that we can get some help from them and of course every single penny uh, that you raise is going to a great great cause because you're doing wonderful work here and you've done wonderful yeah. refurbishment that's right but apart from the refurbishment there's also the day-to-day -day running of the home as well um so we also we need some of the money that we're that are donated to keep the home running as i say on a day-to-day -day basis but also we're trying to raise extra amounts of money um for the refurbishment <laughs> It all started, you know, when I was when I left school uh, in '68, and a friend of mine invited me into Manchester to watch a group that I'd never heard of before, and he took me to the ABC in Manchester to watch the Clancy Brothers and Tommy Maycomb. They were a great group at the time, and I fell in love with them, and I've been singing that sort of music ever since. Of course, the Horton Weavers, the world famous now, aren't you? Your, your name is out there all over. We've been very fortunate. We've had our own television series, our own radio series. Uh, so we, we've been very lucky, very lucky. 30, 33 albums. And Jim, of course, the Blackpool Bell was a big hit for you, but you've had so many hits. Well, I've, I've only been with the group for the last couple of years, although I've followed them all through because I'm, I'm friends with all of them from way back. This time, a couple of years ago, I was busking on the streets of France. And now I'm lucky enough to play with a group like this and to be playing in places like the Bridgewater. So it's a bit different than playing in the streets. Well, absolutely. And of course, you two guys are brothers. That's right. And yeah. we started I've singing. Known him, I've known him quite a long time, <laughs> Martin. Have, yeah. <laughs> we started singing in the bathroom because the acoustics are very good in the bathroom when we were kids, when we were teenagers, doing Beatles songs in harmony. And then I learned how to play the guitar because I wanted to be like Bob Dylan. And that's how it all started back in, when, in our teens. And of course now you're getting involved with Nathan Carter and as you said there you are performing at the Bridgewater Hall. You've got another big concert coming up with Nathan in the summertime. That's correct, yeah. We know Nathan when we used to work on the, in Liverpool or in, on the Wirral. His grandmother used to bring him along as a child, I'm talking 10, 12 years old, and said, can, can my Nathan get up and sing with you? And of course we let him get up and sing with us. So he's very kindly reciprocated and it's, it's, very, it's very nice of him. And Dave, of course, you were there the very first day with Tony when the band was formed. Oh, I was uh, 43 years ago, and it's, do you know, Martin, it's gone like that, in the fl flick of an eye. Uh, we used to practice in my mother's kitchen, uh, and uh, we thought we sounded great, and I still think we sound great. In fact, at the Bridgewater Hall, uh, that's where you saw us, and uh, as I say, 43 years, the Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Who would ever have thought, because we all had day jobs, 
that one day we would stand on stage and make money out of it. Which <laughs> Well, that's it, and you've entertained so many people. And of course, with your own TV show as well down the years, you were very, very popular. Well, uh, we were... Uh, my, my mother actually was responsible partly for that. She said, I've got two, two boys in a band that I think you would be interested in. And Terry Wheeler, the producer, came along to see us. He liked us, and the BBC put us on this programme called Sit Thee Down, we did seven wonderful years, and as you alluded to earlier, it put us on the worldwide stage, not just internationally, but people from all over the world know of the Horton Weavers. And Steve, how long have you been involved with the band? Well, I'm man actually 22 years, Martin, man and boy, and uh, I'm still on probation period. But <laughs> it, what it was, I was actually, uh, the guys approached me to do a Christmas tour, which was about 22 years ago, and, uh, and I've stayed with them ever since. It was... Uh, What's it been like all those years, entertaining so many people in so many different countries? Well, it's been wonderful, absolutely wonderful, Martin. It's been, uh, well, a privilege, really. And the fans are so loyal, very, you know, very like Nathan's fans. And uh, we're very lucky. We, we, we do something uh, we enjoy and we, we get paid for it. And it's, it's a fabulous life. In fact, it's a very charmed life, I think. Yeah, it's been brilliant. And of course tonight you're here entertaining the crowd and trying to raise some money for St Joseph's Home. Yes, absolutely. We've, we've got a, a relationship with... Uh, we've done this before and uh, it's a great cause. And uh, again, we do, you know, we love to come out and support great causes and uh, that's what we're all about really. And, uh, and again, the, the people who come to, uh, to support us uh, buy tickets and, it, and it's a great... Uh, and a great night out as well. And, grows with a big to -do. and the old cow just goes and moo. The dogs and the cats they take up the middle where the honeybee hums and the grey cat fiddles, the donkey brays and the pony lays, and the old grey badger sighs. All God's creatures got a place in the choir. Some sing low and some sing higher, some sing out loud on the telephone wire. Some just clap their hands and pause or anything they got now. Listen to the ducks and the little birds singing with the melodies and the high notes ringing. The hoot owl cries over everything and the blackbird disagrees. Singing in the night time, singing in the day, the little duck quacks and he's on his way and the otter hasn't got much to say and the porcupine talks to himself. Well done to them all at St Joseph's Home for the great work they do. Now don't forget we're moving channel. Next Thursday evening you will find us on Sky Channel 192. The repeats on a Saturday night for the Irish at home and abroad and the Irish in the UK will also be broadcast on Sky Channel 192. So until next week, see you then.